Good afternoon. Um, it's always a pleasure to come to this conference, which is uh, as interesting as the last ones. So today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the flow in the deep mantle. And uh, I, will, I will try to show you that it's really uh, a question of plumes and slabs. And uh, to do this, I'm going to go back and forth between the observation that uh, we're trying to uh, explain and uh, laboratory experiments. So of course, the lab experiments cannot reproduce a lot of uh, the complexities of uh, the Earth, especially, for example, phase transition. Uh, but you can isolate different physical phenomena and uh, study them in a very uh, controlled manner so that uh, you can get some uh, scaling laws, some, some insights uh, about uh, the physics responsible for the observation that we have on Earth. So, of course, this work has been done with uh, a lot of uh, very talented postdoc and students. I've put the list there and a lot of my colleagues. Uh, because uh, my expertise is more about uh, lab experiments and physics. And so when I have to uh, deal about the Earth, it's always more interesting to do it in collaboration. So, ah, ah, time. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, first of all, very quickly, the, the observation that we're interested in. So when we're looking at the tomographic uh, models, uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, the mantle seems uh, we have those two red hot p potatoes at the bottom of the mantle. If you do a contour plot of uh, um, S-wave velocity anomaly, for example, uh, from the S-min model, you see that uh, there is a lot of structure in, the, in those two uh, large low-velocity provinces. <laughs> So the first question is, uh, why do we have uh, only two right now? Uh, so there have been also some papers pointing out that, uh, well, maybe we have uh, some others, uh, hints of those uh, large low-velocity provinces, but not as large. So the geochemistry and uh, mineral physics is telling us that if you want to understand uh, what you sample at the surface and uh, what uh, the, the seismic waves uh, are, are telling us there should be some chemical heterogeneity down there uh, that uh, you're not always sampling and uh, which is probably denser. And uh, geochemistry again is telling us that part of this chemical heterogeneity is probably very old, several billion years old. Then the last observation is that uh, most of the surface hotspots are localized in those two LLSVPs. So if we talk about hotspot, we all know about the very long track hotspots like Hawaii or uh, Easter, La Réunion, and they usually start with a big trap event, a uh, big oceanic plateau or trap on the continent, and they're, they're followed by um, a, track, a, a volcanic track that can be 100 million years uh, long. And uh, from a fluid mechanics point of view, it's very easy to produce this kind of thing if you, if you have a plume, which is usually with a, a big head and a small conduit. And <coughs> what is interesting if you look at those uh, long track hotspot is that in fact, they're all on the edges of the low velocity provinces. And if you trace uh, where were the, the different oceanic plateau and uh, large in years provinces erupted in the last 250 million years where they're also in the vicinity of the edge of those low, uh, uh, large uh, velocity provinces, except a few ones like, for example, uh, the one producing the Siberian trap. Then there is also another type of hotspot on Earth, for example, what the type you can find in uh, the French Polynesia, where you have a lot of shorter tracks, uh, shorter like uh, 20 to 40 million years uh, at most in length, and those shorter tracks are in clusters. So we have uh, this cluster here, and what is interesting is that if you look at the reconstruction, 
Uh, the Darwin Rise, which is another cluster, erupted about 100 million years ago, exactly on where the Polynesia is right now. So there seemed to be uh, a 100 million year recurrence uh, in, those, in this other type of, uh, of um, volcanism. And the last thing is uh, that uh, uh, the more we have resolution in the tomographic models, and uh, uh, the better we can see hot upwellings f coming uh, in the lower mantle, and uh, if we remember about uh, the fluid mechanics image of a thermal plume with a large head and a thin, uh, a thin conduit, this conduit should be at most a hundred, uh, a few hundred in the lower mantle, uh, kilometer thick. But uh, what we're seeing now on the tomographic images is something that is much larger. So. Uh, plumes happen to be fat when we can image them uh, in the lower mantle. And uh, there seems to be also some, something happening at the horizon of a uh, 1,000 to 800 kilometer depth. So to summarize, uh, we go I'm going to try to understand uh, uh, today, uh, do we have any idea about the origin of those mantle boxes, why the mantle cut into those boxes. Then if we zoom on one box, why do we have several types of upwelling and hotspots? What can create an upwelling to be really fat compared to a purely thermal one? And uh, what could happen around a thousand kilometer depth? Then uh, the last question will be about time dependence of the, this uh, large scale division of the mantle. Do we have large uh, provinces in the bottom of the mantle that are changing shapes through time? So the first one. So this is the typical experimental setup. We have a plexiglass trunk. Uh, it's a, a fish tank, uh, 30 by 30 uh, centimeter uh, wide. And <coughs> we can vary the height so that the SP ratio vary between two and five. We can have measurements about uh, the temperature field. So using thermal liquid crystals, you can image isotherm, and you will see a lot of those. We can measure the velocity field using particle tracking features. And uh, we can also have access to the concentration field if we have an heterogeneity in density. This time, we're using fluorescent dyes. So the fluids that we've been using over the years are Newtonian, but with strongly temperature-dependent viscosity, like a sugar syrup. And then lately, we've, uh, 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 we've complexified the problem using polymers and even colloids uh, to have a, a, a rheology that will uh, go from Newtonian in the bulk, like mostly in the mantle, to brittle on the top. But uh, today I will speak uh, mainly about the sugar syrup. So, <coughs> so we are heating from below at a constant temperature and cooling from above at a constant temperature. So uh, the intensity of convection is given by the Rayleigh number, uh, which is the ratio of the engine of convection, so uh, uh, the buoyancy, uh, uh, compared to the two effects that the, the wants to retard or even eliminate uh, the instability, diffusion of heat, and diffusion of momentum. So this really number for uh, the Earth, uh, for a planet, is typically between 10 to 6, 10 to 9. And this is something that is really easy to do in the laboratory right now. So this is an image of uh, the uh, onset of convection. So we are uh, heating from below here. You see first all the isotherm going up, uh, so it's uh, by the diffusion, and then suddenly you have uh, the burst of a plume, and the plume is rising up. So <coughs> this is what is happening uh, in a constant viscosity fluid. You will have hot plumes, and you will have cold plumes. And, but on Earth, we have cold plates and hot plumes, so two different scale of convection. And this is because the viscosity depends strongly on temperature. <coughs> uh, 
And uh, if we're looking at uh, uh, strongly temperature-dependent uh, temperature uh, viscosity convection, you get, uh, for really uh, large viscosity ratio between, between cold and hot, uh, a stagnant lead. And then you have uh, uh, the cellular convection uh, underneath. But there is, uh, for, uh, for large Rayleigh number and intermediate viscosity ratio, there is a very interesting um, regime where you can have uh, a very stable uh, uh, cold downwelling and then encased a number of hot upwelling. So in this case, you have two, uh, uh, two scale of convection, the one with uh, creating the upwellings with a much shorter wavelength here than the one creating the cold downwellings. So uh, we have scaling laws about that, both uh, so in the lab for uh, rigid boundaries, uh, but also uh, for free boundaries. And if you apply the scaling to the mantle, it's telling you that those uh, cold downwelling cells uh, would be about 10,000 kilometers uh, apart. So the, this is the size of the Pacific. It is really a good news. But however, in each of those box, about 10,000 uh, kilometers wide, you will have several of those uh, thermal plumes. The other thing that is interesting is that in the lab we see uh, that uh, the plumes that are the closest from the downwellings are uh, uh, leaves a lot longer. So it's a very uh, good uh, way of explaining why the long tracks are at the edge of the slabs, uh, for example, in the Pacific. So we've answered the first question. Those mantle boxes, in fact, they're due to the variable viscosity of the mantle and they're due to subduction. So the subduction is really cutting your mantle in pieces, in boxes. But then what about the upwellings? So for that, we need uh, to uh, explore what is going on with the density heterogeneities. And so here, it's an experiment with a relay number of about 10 to 7. And uh, we have, uh, <laughs> it's accelerated, as you can see. Uh, so we are heating from below, and so the lower layer that was initially denser because of composition is suddenly uh, getting unstable, and so you have those really big domes going up. But then they're, they're getting co uh, cooling uh, from the top, and then they go down, and, and so on. And the last thing that I want you to uh, see is that on the top of those domes, you have upwellings, because those things, even though they might be denser, they're still hotter, so that they're heating the fluid above it, and so you can have several secondary plumes uh, on the top of those domes. So those domes here are very fat, but we were using a more viscous lower layer using polymers. So here, it's the same type of experiment, this, this, uh, with a localized heat source, and uh, the, uh, the orange layer here, it's exactly the same sugar as uh, this one here, just with a little bit salt of salt um, added. So it's denser, so it gets heated, and then you've got the instability. And this time, with sugar, you have uh, the uh, instability that is less viscous than the ambient. So you go back to uh, the, the plume the plume shape. So this was for a buoyancy ratio uh, of, of about 0 0.4. So the buoyancy ratio, it's really the key parameter to understand uh, this uh, phenomenon, is the ratio of the density of the difference in density of chemical origin, so it's going to stabilize the system, uh, divided by uh, the, the density difference of thermal origin, which wants to uh, destabilize the system. So for a low buoyancy ratio, uh, the thermal effect can counterbalance and overcome completely the compositional effect, and so you can have plume. 
But you see also that uh, the plume was going up, and then this orange, chemically denser, finally went down again. So again, uh, when the plume is rising, it's losing a bit of its heat to the ambient, and so the temperature is decreasing, so that uh, at a certain level, the buoyancy of the orange uh, material becomes denser again. And so you can have uh, plumes that are eventually going to fail uh, to reach uh, the top. So if I increase this local buoyancy ratio, so again, instability, and then rising. But then in this case, uh, you see this, that the level of neutral buoyancy is obtained uh, much lower into the box. <coughs> so in fact, for those thermochemical instabilities, we always have a behavior that is very uh, strongly dependent on time. And uh, we can generate uh, really fat features, even if the inside is less viscous. And this fat feature it's because there is an inner circulation within this dome here. And on top of this hot dome, you can have one or several secondary plume. So <coughs> as you increase the buoyancy ratio, you're going, of course, to decrease the level of neutral buoyancy until uh, B, uh, the buoyancy ratio is uh, greater than one, and then in this case, you, go, you might deform a little bit the interface, but you're just going to have a purely thermal plume with thin filaments untrained, and geochemically, it's those filaments that you're going to uh, sample on the top of your mantle. So, <coughs> so in thermochemical convection, the fat upwellings are due to circulation or to viscosity or both. And if you take a, a strongly non-Newtonian viscosity, like here, for example, you get even more uh, fat plumes. I mean, fat plumes, if you change the, the, the viscosity, are quite easy to get. Then it's quite complicated and time dependent so that when we interpret uh, uh, the, uh, the observation, uh, there is this, uh, this very big constraint of time that we have in some way uh, to include. So, <coughs> so if, uh, um, if every plume that is thermochemical can reach a level of neutral buoyancy, you can understand that if this plume is reaching a boundary, like for example a space boundary and is a little bit delayed in its progression, then this uh, delay through the boundary uh, can even stop it, and then you have again the generation of a cluster of secondary plume on top of your boundary. So all those experiments, of course, are done in, uh, in a fluid that, don't, that doesn't have properties that depends of pressure, on pressure. So, of course, in the real mantle, you have pressure and depth dependence of density. You have different phases. You have thermal expansion varying, viscosity, and so on. So all this is going to modify the level of neutral buoyancy. And that's a very, uh, a very uh, powerful way of stopping or changing the image of your fat plumes at some level in the mantle. And there have been a lot of numerical uh, studies uh, uh, starting with those two pioneering, Basia Gurnis and uh, also Samuel, uh, which showed that, who, that uh, if you have, uh, for example, a density difference uh, between your plume and the ambient mantle that is depending on depth, uh, then you're going to have uh, always, you're always going to reach a level of neutral buoyancy for the, the chemically denser material, but you also can get very uh, different shapes uh, depending on the different properties. And it's a good way to have a very steep uh, boundary, for example, uh, between your instability and the rest of the mantle. So in fact, the fluid mechanics is really predicting that we should have the coexistence of several types of hot, hot instability in the mantle. 
And uh, one very interesting thing is that to have those, uh, to have an effect on the morphology of a plume, uh, you need only density differences between zero, uh, uh, between 0 0.1 and 1%, which is extremely easy to create when you think about what, uh, uh, what the mess the mantle could have been uh, when it becomes solid, or also that uh, uh, we have the reinjection of lithosphere and crust uh, all the time. So it's very easy to create those type of, uh, insta of um, chemical heterogeneities. So then we have scaling laws for the spacing of those instabilities as well. And uh, they show that in the mantle, at the CMB uh, level, you should have uh, one instability uh, every 2,000 to uh, 4,000 kilometer. And uh, within a time scale that is between 100 and 200 million years. So do we see this in the data? So first of all, I was telling you about Polynesia, this hotpots cluster. So I would claim that uh, this is due to a large scale thermochemical uh, dome uh, in the lower mantle that, I that is uh, stuck or is just uh, moving up and you have several plumes on top of it. Uh, the uh, scaling from the lab can give us an idea, a prediction about the oscillation time between two upwelling episodes, and we get for viscosity comparable to the mantle, uh, very easily a periodicity of about 100 million years. So it explains really well da uh, Darwin rise and then Polynesia now. So if I look now at my uh, large low velocity province, so I have already uh, four uh, long track uh, instability on the edge. I have one here also. So uh, if I pave uh, my domain uh, with instability, hot instabilities, and that's what fluid mechanics is telling us that should happen, well, I've got some missing here. So let's look first of all here. Well, uh, Cecilia Cadio, Isabel uh, Panet, and Michel Diamant have looked at uh, the geoid uh, decomposed in wavelet. And it's really very interesting because uh, in this area here, where we had a hole, so there is no volcanism right now on the surface. Well, if you look at the geoid, you have this big anomaly here, quite deep. And if you do the inversion, you see that you can explain uh, the data only if it's a heavy dome, which is descending. So we have Polynesia, we had an upwelling. Here we have a downwelling. Uh, it might be hot, but it's denser, so it's globally going down. What is interesting also is that if you reconstruct where this dome would have been 35 million years ago, then it would have been under part of Line Island which was active 35 million years ago. So it means that 35 million years ago, my dome was up. And uh, the other thing that is uh, very nice is that 140 million years ago, uh, the, the big uh, Ineos province of uh, Shatsky rise was formed in the area. So that we have again a 100 million year cycle in the Pacific. OK, so we are still missing two instabilities. So I was really uh, interested uh, by uh, Anna's uh, talk this morning uh, because uh, Samoa is uh, obviously a very nice candidate. It's at the, at the right place. Uh, it's there. So free mechanics is telling us that, yes, we should have something going on here. And that's exactly what uh, the tomography is seeing. So we have one here, so we need one here. And in fact, this one, so if you look, uh, of course, uh, right above the CMB, you see that there is an extra mer. So it's, uh, it's really hot there. It could create an instability. And if you look into uh, the, um, <coughs> the tomographic model, 
you see uh, something, a big dome that is coming up, but uh, below a, a thousand kilometer depth. So I would propose that we have an instability, but it has not reached the surface yet. It's going up. And you can do exactly the same exercise for the Atlantic. So the upwellings, I think, uh, for the variety of upwellings, and <coughs> you can explain a lot of uh, the observation with compositional density heterogeneities that interact with thermal convection. <coughs> so now about the time dependence uh, of those large low velocity provinces. Well, if you, <coughs> the big problem on Earth is uh, the, uh, the, the time constraint. So for example, if we, if we look just at tomography, for example, if we look at this uh, big uh, uh, transect here, we see something going up around here, and then everything is stuck in the upper mantle. And so of course, we would like to say, okay, it's rising here, and then it's doing this. Well, and uh, in the lab, in all the experiments we've done, well, uh, fortunately, we have also uh, the same end result for one of the experiment, but we have all the history. And so that's the beginning, so I'm hitting my mantle from below. Okay. Then, but then I've got the instability starting and the plume rising, and that's what I get at the end. So in fact, convection <coughs> is a very time-dependent phenomenon, and it's a very good way to carry fast hot material from the bottom to the top. And you can do exactly the same exercise for thermochemical convection. If you look at this guy here, it's rising, and then now there isn't anything anymore. So that I would claim that uh, the LLSVP's area, in fact, every time you have a, a big plume head event, it means that you've taken uh, material from the bottom and put it uh, uh, at the top. And so the area should decrease every time you have one of those big plumes. And that's probably also, if you look, for example, at camp right now, the, most of the reconstruction uh, below, it, it's not red anymore, it's on the side. Uh, same for Louisville, if you say that it was on Tong Java, and, and so on. And the last thing also is that uh, fluid mechanics is telling us, okay, cellular uh, cold cells that are about uh, 10,000 kilometers wide, so it's nice for the Pacific, but if I pave my hearse with this, I can have six cells. So of course, you're going to t t tell me there is continence. But even though uh, there is twin mechanics is saying that uh, there is uh, no reason why we should have only two, all the more that we saw that every time we have a slab coming down, it's pushing the denser m material around. So, <coughs> so it could be interesting, for example, to look at what is happening here. This uh, red dot here is right under the position that will have had uh, the Siberian traps when they erupted. If you uh, do uh, cross-section, uh, I took here uh, the ESMIN model, and <coughs> so this is uh, uh, this uh, point here. And if you do cross-section, you can very well see uh, the subduction, so the Pacific one, but also the Tetis. And you see that in fact, uh, so the Tetis one is quite a new one. It's the one that is, uh, uh, especially in the Mediterranean, it has started not a very long time ago. So, and you see that it's the, it's, uh, the slab that is cutting uh, this Siberian anomaly uh, to the Icelandic one. So I would propose that maybe that 200 million years ago or 300 million years ago, we had one box here, one here, but then we may have had a, a big one linking the Siberian uh, trap location to Iceland on the top of our mantle. So as a conclusion, <coughs> 
I think that uh, the, there is two main messages. Uh, one is that uh, compositional density heterogeneities can really explain a lot of uh, the um, evolution and uh, morphology and different types of plumes. <laughs> but now we have to do uh, a lot of work on understanding how you create those density heterogeneities and how they evolve uh, with pressure, for example. And then even the largest scale of convection in the mantle due to slabs is strongly varying through time, so that the image that we see now is, was uh, probably not the one of 100 million years ago, and uh, all the, the models that we've seen this morning, for example, uh, uh, by Nicola and so on, uh, show exactly the same thing. And at the billion-year scale, it's, it was uh, completely different. Thank you. <laughs>